Well, because of the landmark Supreme Court decision this week, Ashley has asked me to pray for our congregation and for our country. Whether you're watching online or on one of our campuses, would you join me in prayer? Holy Father, we know, because you told us in Psalm 129, that you knit us together in our mother's womb. And so we know that you care about unborn children. And we also know that you care about mothers who are pregnant and that that very pregnancy will lead to difficulties in their lives. As we pray for those mothers that our church in tangible ways would continue as we have for decades, care for these mothers and, and provide through our mission partners services and opportunities that would help alleviate some of those struggles. And we also pray because we know that our country is divided over this, that we become, as a church, we become peacemakers by prioritizing Jesus Christ, the only one who can unite everyone under his leadership and his promise of salvation in his name. It is in that powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, families are messy, aren't they? I know mine can be. In fact, I got in a, in a contest with a friend of mine a while back, and the contest was, was entitled, uh, Whose Family is Weirdest? And the way you play the game is you tell a story about like a weird uncle, or, or maybe about a, a kid that's in trouble with the law, or that cousin that always blows up Thanksgiving. They always do it. And we have these stories of our own family. Some we talk about, some we don't talk about, but families are messy. Uh, he won the contest, but barely. Families are weird. And my guess is that if I got in that contest with you, some of you would just crush me because your family is whoo-hoo. And we, just, we, we know families are beautiful and challenging and awkward, and they're also God's design. And one of the things that always happens with families, it happened with mine, it happened with yours, is when you create your own family, you, you, you build a home yourself, your family of origin informs you about the roles that you're supposed to play. So in my family, my mother was, um, she was politically kind of left. My, my father was just to the right of Ronald Reagan. My mother was just to the left of Hillary Clinton. So it's no surprise that they didn't stay married. But I went into my, into my marriage with these expectations. So my dad was fairly passive. My mom was about as passive as a honey badger. My wife's family was the opposite. The dad was more dominant, mom was more demure. And so we just had different expectations of what the other one would be. Now, can you believe that that would cause fights in our family? Actually, it caused no fights. Because we're both passive. We're powders, not shouters. So in some ways, that's even worse. We had to get over that. But families, they, they create these expectations in you, don't they? Of what the other is supposed to be like. And the Bible actually speaks to these expectations. And I'm going to read a passage in a moment that's, is, well, the technical term for it is the uh, family codes or household codes. Several times in the New Testament, God says, look, this, this is what's gonna be best for you if husbands act like this and wives act like this and kids act like this. Now, we're not promoting a leave it to beaver family. There are none of those. There are no perfect families and there are no perfect models. Some of you have great families and you're single parents or blended families. Some grandparents are raising grandchildren. So there's no one right way to do it. But there is God's way of attitudes of ha uh, that you take for other people. I'm going to tell you why that's so critically important. Because whether you recognize it or not, and, and most people I would say probably don't, your family is a sermon to your friends and family and neighbors. So let me just ask the question. This is a question of the day. Do outsiders see Christ when they see inside your home? Do outsiders see Christ when they see inside your home? And so I want to just talk about how to have a message, a sermon without words that preaches Christ well. But the problem is, as soon as I turn to this passage, there's three statements I'm going to read about husbands and kids and wives. One of them might trigger someone. 
Oh, you already know what's coming? Okay, then I'll just read it. Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. Whoo. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Okay, which one of those might trigger someone? Yeah, wives respecting their husbands. Because I've been told this by some wives who say, yeah, but my husband's not respectable. Fair point, but we need to talk about that. In, in, the, in the days of Paul, when Paul wrote this, that would not have triggered any wife because every wife expected to respect her husband. Here's why. This might shock some of you. In all of the Mediterranean world, Egyptians, Romans, Greeks, Jews, a woman was property of her husband. She had to obey him. Or she could be physically beaten for disobey and there would be no charges because that wasn't illegal. A man had the power of life and death over wife and children. Now, he might be disrespected for killing a child, but he wouldn't be arrested. So that wouldn't have shocked anybody. You know what would have stunned everybody in Paul's day? Is when Paul said, husbands, love your wives. You go, well, why would I have to do that? Like I'm the leader. Leadership in Paul's day was very domineering, whether it's politics or business or religion. If you're in charge, you're large and you can hammer down, make everybody around you do whatever you want. And Paul comes along and says, no, husbands, love your wives. Why? Because they're lovable? Not always. Now, I've never personally met an unlovely woman, but theoretically, <laughs> there could be a moment where a woman could be unlovely, right? You don't, husbands, you don't love your wives because she's lovable. You love your wife because she needs to be loved. I've never met a wife that didn't need to be loved and valued and cherished. And so you give your wife what she needs, not what she deserves. Wives, you give your husband what he needs, not what he deserves. You go, well, he's not respectable. I, I get, look, I get that because I've been one. But I will tell you, I'm a pretty self-confident dude. But when it comes to my wife, I need her to respect me. And if she ever disrespects me, which is like seldom or rare or never, it's, it just crushes me. As confident as I am. Why? Because I want to be your hero. I need to be her hero. Guys, you hear, hear what I'm saying? And here's what happens. This is so extraordinary. God is so wise with this. When you provide the other what they need, they can become what you want. What, what they want to become. We empower the people in our family to be the better version of themselves. And when wives respect their husbands, they become more respectable. And when husbands love their wives, they become more lovely. And when children obey their parents, they become better parents. This is so much like Jesus. Like if you're not a Christ follower and you hear this and go, yeah, I don't believe that. Oh, okay, fair enough. You're, you're not a Christ follower. We don't expect you to go by the rules of the road of Christianity. But if you're a Christ follower and you say, Jesus is my Lord, what did Jesus give you? What you deserved or what you needed? See, he's not asking you to do anything that he hasn't already done for you. And when families begin to provide each other what they need, not what they deserve, they become the best version of themselves. They become actually what you want and what they want to become. And I saw this in action last Sunday. And it has to do with children obeying their parents. I was at the Scottsdale campus and I was watching the baptisms, a huge fan. And so I'm just enjoying these baptisms. And a, a young man named Will, 11 years old, Will got baptized. He went to one of our kids' camps and was convicted that he wants to give his life to Jesus. So he comes home and says, Dad, I want to get baptized. He's, he's honoring his father, asking for permission. And the dad said, you know what? I've never been baptized. I need to be baptized. 
And so his dad, I got to watch this. His dad was baptized into Christ and turned right around and invited his son into the baptistry and he baptized his own son on Father's Day. What a fantastic story. And, and if you're thinking, man, I would have loved to have seen that, guess what, you can. Because on all of our campuses, we are having baptisms for those kids that went to camp. I would encourage you, if you can, and you can, just pop by the, the baptistry on your campus. And if you're watching online, get in the car, drive to the nearest campus. If you need binoculars, go ahead. But just, just watch wherever you're comfortable watching and see what God is doing. There are extraordinary stories. And when we give what the other needs, they can become what we want. And this doesn't just work in the home, it works at work. Of course, in Paul's day, the home and the work were the same environment. Like they didn't go off to work, they worked in their family compound with extended relatives and their servants and employees. So Paul is not talking about something different now in verse 22 when he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, I understand we, we don't have slavery in our country, at least not legally. You know why that is? It's actually because of this passage. This passage in Colossians, as well as its sister book, Philemon. Those two books, Colossians, Philemon, written by the same man, a guy named the Apostle Paul, writes to this same church, Church of Colossae, at the same time. And these two letters, the Philemon is just one chapter, it's a short little thing. Colossians was written to the whole church, Philemon was written just to this one man. But it was read out loud in front of the church. Here's why Paul wrote the letter of Philemon. Philemon was a Christian, but also a slave owner. They didn't know any better. And one of his slaves ran away. His name is Onesimus. And he ran to Paul. And Paul said, Onesimus, listen, you're a Christian now. And so you got to act like a Christian, which means you need to submit to the authorities that God has put over you, including your master. And some of you are saying, well, why didn't Paul just tell Philemon to free him because slavery is an abomination? And it is. Paul did something more shrewd than that and more permanent than that. He tells Onesimus, give Philemon what Philemon needs and he will become what you want. And then he told Philemon, give Onesimus what he needs and he will become what you want. And he actually told Philemon, treat Onesimus as a Christian brother. Now think about that. If, if you treat someone as a brother, how long can you keep them enslaved? It was because of this letter that in the Roman world, when Christians began to grow and proliferate the Roman world, that slavery was demolished from the inside out. And it happened again in the British Empire, and it happened again in the Americas. When you offer the other what they need, they can become what you want. And so this is the advice that Paul gives, and I know we don't have slaves and masters, but we do have employers and employees. So here's for all you employees out there, listen up, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. How different would you work if Jesus was your boss? I bet you get to work on time more often. I bet you'd work late more often. I bet you'd have a better attitude and less gossip around the water cooler if Jesus was your boss. And what Paul is saying is he is. Your reward does not come from your employer. It comes straight from Jesus himself who is your ultimate master. And then Paul turns around and talks to the CEOs in here, to the bosses and managers in here. Chapter four, verse one, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair. They actually paid their slaves and they could buy their own uh, emancipation if they needed to. Because you know that you also have a master in heaven. And a week after 
We in our country celebrated the emancipation, the proclamation of emancipation of Abraham Lincoln. We read this passage, how timely. What would you do for your employees if you saw them as family? Would you give them compensation differently? Days off differently? A workload differently? Paul is telling you employers and you employees to work as if you're working for the Lord, not working for a paycheck. This applies not only to home and to work, it also applies to the church. Because again, in Paul's day, the church and work and your family was in one building. It was your, your household, your domicile. And so he, he, he now addresses the church and how you give the others what they need in the church. Verse two, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Are you watching what's going on at your church right now? Have you seen the record number of kids at camp? Have you been observing the growth of our campuses? Are you aware that our attendance right now is larger than it was pre-COVID? It is a rare church that can say that. God is blessing us. We're in the middle of a revival right here at CCB right now. Are your eyes open? Are you grateful for what God has given us in this season? If you are, then I want to ask you to do what Paul asked the, Col the Colossians to do. This is verse 3. Pray for us that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in change. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And I want to ask church online on our campuses if you would pray with me right now for our senior pastor. You've noticed he's been away in June. It's a season for him to get with God and to pray and hear from the Lord so he can lead us with integrity. We have no idea the weight of the mantle that God has put on his shoulders. So it is right for us to pray for his strength and support. Would you join me? Holy Father, we are grateful for Ashley and his family. We're grateful that he leads with such integrity, a clarity of vision and purpose. And I pray that you would protect him and protect his family. Put men and women around him that would help him excel in this ministry so that all of us together could reach this entire valley for Jesus Christ. This is our prayer. We ask for a yes in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, why, why, would we, why would we pray like that for the church? Why would we work like that? Or why would we treat other people in our family like that? It's, it's not just for the good of your family. It's not for the good of your employer. It's for the good of those outside of Christ. Let me ask you again. When outsiders look inside your home, do they see the message of Christ, the sermon you're preaching without using words? It's, it's easy for us to overlook the important role that every member of this church plays. Even in a church as, as great as ours, I think the majority of people don't understand what God has actually called them to do to contribute to the salvation of the lost. Most people think that church is what you come to on the weekend. No, church is what you are in the week. And a couple weeks ago, we preached a message where we talked about turning your work into worship. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. When you turn your work into worship and your home into a sermon, then you have the power to reach people for Jesus Christ without ever preaching a sermon. The most important words of this church are not what we speak on this stage. It's the lives that you live in your neighborhoods, with your families, on all of our campuses scattered around. In every employment that you go to from Monday through Friday, God is calling you to be the church, not just to go to church. Listen to how Paul phrases it in verse 5. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity 
Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. How can we make the most of every opportunity that we have? It's how we act and how we answer. And this word answer in the original language is it's not like academic. Someone asks you a Bible question, Johnny on the spot, you got the right answer. Now, this is not a Bible quiz. Answer, that particular word means to evaluate. So let me rephrase it. How do you make the most of every opportunity to reach people for Christ? It is how you act and react. When you see the needs that people have, how do you respond to those needs? How do you live in such a way that they would be envious of your home? We, we have a couple in our neighborhood group, and it, it, was a, it was a while before he came to Christ. And when he did, like nobody could believe it. He came to Christ. He started coming to church, and his friends go, I never saw that coming. But he'll never get baptized. And then he got baptized, and they're going, whoa, like something's happening in their family. And when he got baptized, I took his wife aside, and I said, I want to ask you one question. Is he a better husband? I talked to them just a couple of days ago. It's been over a year now, and I talked to them a couple days ago, and now their previous friends are going, okay, so this church thing, maybe it, maybe it is something we need to invest in because they're seeing their marriage is so much better. The way they're raising their kids is so much better. The way they're getting along is so much better. Isn't that the message that people are looking for, for hope in this world? And so how are we going to spread that message? As Paul concludes this book, it's it, the next 10 verses are actually 10 different names. And I know they're kind of boring because you don't know the names and you don't know all their stories, like who knows about Tychicus and Onesimus. But even though the names may be unfamiliar to you, their stories might be familiar. Paul does at the end of Colossians what happens at the end of a great movie where the credits begin to roll. He just start naming names of people who contributed in a variety of different ways to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm wondering if you could find your name or replace their name with yours because your story is the same. I was talking to a friend of mine about this and she said she and her husband just went to a movie in Hollywood. At the end of the movie, when everybody gets up and leaves, the credits are scrolling, nobody left. You know why? Because everybody knew somebody that had done something for the film. And when everybody in this city knows somebody that's done something for the gospel of Jesus, then your name could be on this list. And you could contribute to the ongoing work of God. Now, how do you find your name on the list? Uh, let me help. I'm going to take these 10 names and put them in three categories and just ask, could you put your name there? The first category is ambassadors. They invite people to church. People like Tychicus are ambassadors for the Apostle Paul. There's also Onesimus and Aristarchus. I've already told you the story of Onesimus, so you already know sometimes being an ambassador will cost you. Tychicus traveled extensively for Paul in very dangerous terrain. Onesimus had actually been in prison with Paul. Are you willing to make the sacrifice so that you could contribute to the gospel of Jesus Christ by inviting someone to church? And listen, Ashley's going to be back next week. He's preaching a, a new sermon series called At the Movies. We've done this before. He is so excited about this. I am too, because at the movies, you take a blockbuster film that all of your neighbors have seen and you put it next to the scriptures that they've not seen, and you begin to point out how the principles of God show up even in the films with life lessons that they can take away. It is an easy invite. In fact, for your friends that are far from God, this might be the widest on-ramp all year. So would you invite someone next week at, at the movies? Here's why this is really important. More people move into the valley in July than any other month. Get ready to bring kids to school. So if you see a moving van on your street, rather than just closing the garage door and getting to the AC, I don't blame you for that. 
would you just walk up the street and they need to know like where to find a barber. They need to know where to shop. They need to know about doctors and they need a church. Even if they've never been to church, would you be an ambassador, an advocate that or an ambassador that invites them? Second category is an advocate. There are people that just helped Paul with the ministry. And one of my favorite stories is uh, Mark. Not just because he's got a great name, but <laughs> Luke and Mark are both mentioned in this list because they traveled with Paul. And, and th those are the two guys, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four gospels. Mark wrote one of the gospels. And like that Mark, this Mark did some stupid stuff as a young man. He was on the first missionary journey with the Apostle Paul. His, his cousin Barnabas had, had got him a you know, back, back seat in, on the bus to go on that first missionary journey. But for whatever reason, John Mark left early. And Paul never forgave him for that. And so years later, Acts 16, Barnabas goes to Paul and says, Hey, Paul, let's go and visit the churches that we planted on the first journey. And he goes, Yeah, that's a great idea. And Barnabas said, I'm bringing John Mark. Paul goes, no, you're not. Now, I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly how it went, but it was something like this. Barnabas said, no, I am taking John Mark. He was helpful then, he's gonna be helpful now. And Paul goes, yeah, but he, he apostatized. I actually use that Greek word, he apostatized. And you could just see Barnabas go, no, he didn't apostatize. He's a young man, he made a mistake, he went home early, got homesick, but we're taking him now. And Paul goes, no, I'm not taking him. Well, you got to take it because I'm leading the, you're not leading the trip. I'm leading this trip and I'm, I'm the one who's going to say who goes and who does it. This is too important to take a risk on a flaky young man. And Barnabas, oh, he would have come on court. You mean take a risk like I took on you to introduce you to the apostles when you came to Jerusalem? You have no friend but me. John Mark is going. <laughs> Woo. I mean, can you imagine poor John Mark sitting there looking at it going, I think the first missionary couple's getting a divorce because of me. <laughs> and yet, when Paul wouldn't have him, he attached himself to Peter. And it's Peter's preaching that he recorded in the Gospel of Mark. And years later, Paul is getting ready to die. He's in a prison cell and he pens his final letter to Timothy. And in chapter four of 2 Timothy, he writes, bring John Mark because he's valuable to me. When you become an advocate and you start serving on one of our campuses, some of you know this painfully well. People are messy, just like your family's messy. And sometimes their struggles. Would you get over it so that you can get on with it? of serving the people of God so that we can reach this valley for Jesus Christ. It's not going to be easy and it's not gonna be clean, but it will be the best story you ever tell in your life. There's a third category. Maybe you could find your name in this category of host. Simply people who opened their home. The guy who planted the church in Colossae was named Epaphras. And it was so successful that the church grew and it outgrew his home. So a woman named Nympha said, well, I'll, I'll let people meet in my home. She opened her home and that one filled up. So then they went to Archippus and said, Archippus, we, we, we need your house. And Archippus opened his home. What I'm telling you is not, not now, because it's July. Many of our groups aren't meeting right now. But we're, we're poised for a jump in attendance in August and September. And when groups start meeting in September again, and all are in full force, we're gonna need some new homes. Would you open your home? Yeah, but my home is messy. Yep, so is mine. Everybody says. Yeah, but I don't know if I know enough. Yep, nope, you don't, and nobody does. Would you just be willing to host in your home, whether you're a host in your home or an advocate on campus, or an ambassador out in the community. We need people to take seriously their opportunity to make Jesus famous all across this valley. The hope of the world is the local church. Not when people come to church on the weekends, but when we become the church, turning our work into worship and our homes into sermons. And some of you right now, you just feel dry. 
every family tree has broken limbs. You know that. And some of your, your roots are withered because you're in a desert season in your spiritual life. And you're just wondering if God could show up, if, if, if there could ever be refreshment and peace and hope again. You know this is true. Our God specializes in making things bloom in desert. And I want you to th think about this question as we're going to sing this song together. Would you use this song to plead with God to help you bloom right now? Not so that your life would be better or your family's life would be better, but so that your sermon from your home would preach Christ clearly. Father, we know that in the dryness of a desert, things still bloom. And you have a way of making a way for us to be the way for others to come to Christ. Would you surprise us now with your goodness as you heal our hearts and help us invest in this community in desperate need of Jesus? Amen. Can we 
restored Right now we are I feel the presence of the one who can restore I've seen him do it We're in the presence of the one who can restore We declare it I feel the presence of the one who can restore Yes I do, we say We're in the presence of the one who can restore Come on, who's in? We need you, church, to be the church. It's not about coming on the weekends. It's not about coming and hearing a sermon. This is the huddle, the game is out there. We need you to play the game, get in the game, whether that's as an ambassador or an advocate or opening your home as a host. We need you to be the church Monday through Friday because this valley of ours, this, this place we call home, the people that we love, there are over four million people heading to a crisis eternity, and I'm not okay with that. Your family's not perfect, neither is mine. But it's enough. It's enough for God to come in and water so that you can bloom. This isn't just good theology, this is good psychology. Do you know the number one thing that you have to do to get out of your depression, to get out of your anxiety, to get out, to get out of your own head? The number one thing is to do one thing that someone you cares about needs. It's all about service. And when we mobilize the people of God in our city, we'll see a revival. God is going to show up, and he's gonna show up through you. So let's go out and make Jesus famous.